What's up everybody and welcome to another video. Do you know how to use a CNC? Yeah, me neither. But if you've been following along with me on Instagram, you know that I just got the brand new X-Carve from Inventables. I spent the last few days setting it up and creating a little workstation for it in my shop. And now I am ready to put it to use for the first time. The only issue is I have no idea how to do that. I've never used a CNC before and I have no experience using CNC software. So we are gonna learn together. Can I let you in on a little secret? I actually really like making videos like this, not only because I love learning new things, but also because they're really easy to make because I'm just regurgitating things to you, the audience, as I learn them myself for the first time. And speaking of learning new skills, have you heard of the sponsor of today's video, Skillshare? Because they are all about learning new skills. Skillshare is an online community where you can learn directly from creative professionals working in the field. I just finished taking Dale McManus's course on iPhone photography and I loved it. Since taking it, I really come to appreciate just how powerful the camera inside my phone really is. He taught me that you don't need razor thin depth of field to take interesting photos. You just need to focus on composition, color, and storytelling through photography. And Dale does a really good job of explaining exactly how to do that. Skillshare members have unlimited access to a wide range of classes from everything from photography straight through to logo design, and it's all completely ad free. It's a great service. I've been enjoying it a lot, and I think you will too. Right now, Skillshare has a special offer for my viewers. The first 1,000 people to register with a link in the video description will get a one month free trial of Skillshare so that you can start exploring your creativity today. Okay, so before we head to the shop, I think there's a few things that we had to discuss here at home first. Number one, let's just talk about what we're going to be building today. I recently got this new laptop here and when I'm not using it, it just sits on top of the desk and I don't know, I'm a bit of a neat freak. So I would like to create a dedicated spot where I can put this when it's not in use. I also happen to have this vertical drawer here that's not being used. So what I would like to do is transform this drawer into a dock for my laptop. I can plug it in, have a charge, and then also connect to my main display up there. And then over here in this drawer, I've got a little bit of a problem. This is the drawer where I store all of the lenses that I use to make these videos. And as you can see, when I open and close the drawer, they tend to rattle around a little bit, which is not great for their delicate optics. So I would like to create an organizer that keeps these lenses a little bit more secure. Two relatively simple projects, but both I kind of think would be a pain in the ass to make with traditional woodworking techniques. But with the CNC, they should be a breeze. Or at least I think they're gonna be a breeze. I don't really know because I've never used the CNC before. So today we're gonna find out if the hype around CNCs is real. Step number one on this build was just trying to figure out what I wanted to make. So I took some measurements of my drawers and all of the stuff that I wanted to put in them and came up with a very rough analog sketch. Now that we have all of our measurements done, it is time to take things digital. So Inventables, the company that makes the X-Carve, also makes ESOL, which is their online web-based CNC control software. It's supposed to be pretty easy to use and you get a free pro membership with it when you buy an X-Carve. So we are gonna boot that up and put it to the test. Transferring all my measurements to ESOL was pretty intuitive. I did have a few false starts when I was still figuring out the program, but once I got into the swing of things, it was smooth sailing. The left side of the screen is where you draw the path for your cutting head, and then the right side of the screen is a 3D preview of what you're going to create. I started with the brackets for my laptop, as well as a little cable management loop, and then after that was done, I graduated to the lens organizer drawer where I had some fun messing around with different cut heights and trying to figure out how to engrave text. Okay, now that we got our shapes all programmed into easel, I think we're ready to do some carving. So let's head to the shop. But before we do that, I want to show you how I mounted my CNC because I'm pretty proud of it. If you look around the shop behind me here, you'll see that there's not a lot of space to put a big three foot by three foot CNC machine. So I decided to just float it. I welded up the steel frame and then I lag bolted it to the wall. And then this outside corner here, I just hung from the roof joist up above. I can still keep my rolling tools comfortably stored beneath it, and it's at a nice working height for a tall guy like me. Now, I believe we just turn the machine on, and then we plug it into the laptop. I already downloaded and installed the special inventable drivers on my laptop, so we should be good to go. Let's see. Yeah, that's a moving CNC. I know this is super immature, but when I move it around with a keypad, it sounds exactly like Pac-Man. Listen. Ah, 
so much nostalgia. Okay, let's get down to business. One adjustment that I still have to make is entering the exact measurements of my materials. When I was at home, I didn't know exactly what I had in the shop, so I just entered some placeholder values, but now that I have my hands on the actual material itself, I'll measure this precisely and enter all that info into easel. Defining the size of your materials is pretty important for the X-Carve to function correctly, so make sure you take your time with this step. The more precise your measurements are, the better your results are gonna be. The easel software is now telling me that the next step is to secure our material to the bed. So I'm gonna go ahead and do that. For this first test carve, I am using some scrap birch plywood that I had kicking around. So if this works out, we'll do it all again in a nicer material. Okay, so I'm gonna press this button to confirm that the material is secure. And now it looks like the next step is confirming the bit. So this is actually one area where I did skip ahead a little bit. When I got the X carve, I got two cutting heads with it. Both of these are V-shaped carving heads, which aren't exactly great for cutting things out. They're more meant for engraving. So I went online, I did a little research and I realized that I needed to get some straight cutting heads. Oh, and then you also have to tell easel that you're using a different bit because the path that the head takes changes depending on the bit you're using. And now the next thing that we have to do is zero the machine. Since I have the optional probe kit, I'm gonna go ahead and hit probe here. Now we have to move the machine over the material. Okay, it seems pretty good, confirm. Next we gotta plug this in here. Here, attach the clip to the collet and touch the plate to check for conductivity. Now we hit start probing. So now it knows where the z-axis zero is. So I'll unplug this and it's telling me to take this away. But I still don't know how it knows where the material is on the bed of the machine. Maybe we'll figure that out in the next step. Yeah, okay. So the next step is to move the head of the router to the bottom left corner of the material, or in other words, the X and Y zero location. It's telling me to attach the dust collection boot. So I'll just slide this in here, turn on the router, and then there is a glowing blue carve button. Here we go. After I hit carve, it was basically hands off for me. I watched the machine do its thing for the first little bit, and then I spent the next 15 minutes answering emails. Once the X-Carve had finished, I shut down the spindle, undid the clamps, and inspected the final results. And last one, check it out. So that's interesting. I was wondering how it was going to handle actually cutting all these pieces out, because obviously you can't cut all the way out, otherwise these pieces would rattle around. So what it's done is it strategically left it attached to the board in a few areas, but I can feel like yeah, this is already ready to pop out. So pop this out here. I guess we'll have to clean up that edge a little bit. And then we gotta pop this one out too. Well, this one's a little tighter in there. All right, sweet. Now let's see if these work. So I want to attach this bracket in here like so. Then I want to make a second one there. And then the laptop should just slide down into there comfortably. That's actually not bad for a first try. I might try and get this a little bit tighter and I might try and extend this piece so that it's flush with this edge here, but that's pretty dang close to what I wanted. The nice thing about having the software mobile is that I can just make any changes I need to make right here. 10 minutes in easel was all it took to make a couple of tweaks to the shape and size of my laptop rack. I moved a few coordinates around and then set up for another carve. The second carve was as painless and hands-off as the first. I still had to be there, mind you, you know, in case anything went wrong or a fire broke out, but I spent most of my time just cleaning the shop while the machine did all of the heavy lifting. Let's see how carve number two turned out. And actually looking at it right away, I can see I didn't go all the way through in some places. So probably a good idea to include a little margin for error when you're measuring the thickness of the material. Better to go a little too heavy rather than a little too light. That's okay, I think I can force this out of here anyways. Yeah, there we go. Ah, nice. Bring it over here to our test drawer and we can see that yes, this is nice and flush now. And if I test with the laptop, yeah, that goes in a little bit easier. It's a little thicker here, so it should be a little stronger and then hold on to it a little bit better. I think we're ready to make this out of walnut for real now. You know what's funny? I just grabbed this scrap of walnut to use and I realized that this is leftover walnut from when I first built the desk. So very fitting that I'll be using it on this project. And then I was also noticing, I'm pretty sure I can get two of these brackets out of a single piece of walnut if I just mess around with the file a little bit. This was actually really easy to do in the easel software. I just copied and pasted the first bracket and then applied a couple 
couple of flip transformations to it. No need to redraw anything super easy to do. I then locked the material in place and hit the carve button for the third time. On this run, I was curious to see if the machine would cut the walnut as smoothly as it cut the plywood. You can actually select the different types of material you're cutting in the easel software, which seems to affect the speed of the spindle head. This run definitely took a bit longer, but in fairness to the machine, it was cutting a thicker material and it had a much longer cutting map to contend with. First real cut with real wood as opposed to plywood. Very nice. Oh, that's really clean. Break them out. Again, I really got to emphasize you want to over carve it a little bit so that these pieces are easier to get out. Yeah, there we go. That wasn't so bad. Let's see, this guy goes in here, fits nicely there. This one fits nicely there, looking good. This one will go somewhere there. I haven't quite figured that out. We had to do a little bit of sanding and a little bit of uh, polishing on these pieces just to get them looking nice. But before we do that, let's carve the organizer for our other drawers. Well, those other pieces we're cutting on the X-Carve, I was over on the table saw cutting this, this piece of three quarter walnut plywood that is perfectly sized so that it fits like so into this drawer. I don't wanna drop it in here cause it's quite tight and I'm not sure I'd be able to get it back. This is going to be our lens organizer piece. And this carve is gonna be a little bit more intricate and we're gonna to have to do it in two passes. So the first one is just gonna be cutting out all the circular holes for the lenses to slot into. Then we're gonna to have to change the router head, come back and do an engraving layer that's going to engrave all the focal lengths. I'm not quite sure how that's gonna go swapping the heads and getting all the different carves to happen at the right time. So it's gonna be interesting, but I'm starting to feel a little bit more confident on this thing. Despite my confidence, here is where I show my ignorance of the easel software. I don't know if it's possible to have two different types of carves on the same map. So I split my map for the lens organizer into two pieces. One map has all of the straight cuts with a straight bit, and then the second second map has all of the engraving cuts with the V-carve bit. If there are any easel experts watching this video and there's a better way to do this, I would love to hear it down in the comments. Alrighty, all our clamps are securely in position. We're all zeroed out. This first pass is going to be cutting out all those circular holes and then we'll do the carving pass second. That's the first cut done. Now, without moving anything, I'm gonna try and swap to a carving head and then switch to the carving map and run the same template without having to re-zero everything. Now, I'm realizing that I am probably going to have to reset the Z-axis because there's no way that this bit is gonna go in at the exact same depth as the old one, but we should be able to get it pretty close. There we go. Okay, nice. All right, here we go. At first, my engraving pass was going pretty great. I was getting nice straight lines with crisp edges, but then things started to look a little bit more suspect. Like maybe my spindle wasn't quite carving as deep as it should be. And then from there, things only got worse. Hmm. Okay, so that didn't work very well. A couple issues on the engraving pass. Let me show you what happened. The bigger letters like this 85 and even the 24 back here are cut really nicely. But then if you look at some of these other ones like the 70 to 200 here, it's barely even etched in there. So I did a little experiment here. I made the 100 millimeter macro a little bit bigger and then I tried setting the depth of the 70 to 200 just deeper. So we'll see if it's a size thing or just a depth issue. Check, check, card. Unfortunately, the second engraving attempt didn't go that much better than the first one. So this is a bit of an odd result that I can't explain at all. Doesn't seem to matter what depth I set the text to, it's still not cutting any deeper. What does seem to help is making the text a little bit bigger, which I still find kind of confusing. So honestly, at this point, I'm wondering if I didn't set the zero depth right on it. So I think I'm just gonna scrap this piece and we're gonna try again from the start. Second time's a charm. Wish me luck here. That's good to go. There we go. That's a good start, it's cutting. The first pass with the straight cut head will just breeze right through because I wasn't too worried about that one. The real test would come once I switched the bits and tried engraving again. Seemed good, try this again. You see me crying in the next shot, it's because this didn't work. Um, Looking better. Thankfully, there was no need for tears on this second attempt. All of my engravings came out much better. 
The only explanation that I can come up with for the issues that I had on my first attempt was that I just didn't zero the machine properly. So if there's any takeaway here, it's probably that you should really take your time on that step. Okay, so that went way better than last time. That is much more like what I was expecting. Let's get this thing installed. Got to pop out all these little cutouts. Twist. Yeah, there's one. Maybe I'll save these as little toasters or something. Oh, this one doesn't want to quite twist out. There we go. After I broke out all my little plywood pucks, I used a fine rasp to remove the rough edges where they had been attached. And then to smooth everything out, I gave it a good sand. And then another good sand after that, just to be safe. I figure this organizer is not gonna work very well if it's sitting right at the very bottom of the drawer, because then it's just gonna be gripping the first three quarters of the lenses, and yeah, it might stop them from sliding around, but it won't really stop them from rattling that much. So what I'd like to do is flip this over and attach some little plywood feet to the bottom of it. That way, I think it's gonna grip the lenses that much better. And in order to do that, I'm going to just CA glue them in place. The nice thing about CA glue is that when you use an activator spray, like I am here, you can permanently attach stuff in seconds. So this step took no time at all. If I did everything right, this should just drop in here like so. A little tight, but that's exactly how I want it. That's not bad looking. Let's get some lenses and test. So I don't have all of my lenses here. Some of them are still at home because they don't all fit in the camera bag, but I do have some here. So this is the 24 to 70. Oh, that fits so nice. This is the 100 Mac. This one goes in here nicely. And then the 85. Oh, beautiful. Well, that's one drawer fit and ready to be finished. Let's see if we can go for number two. This should be relatively simple. I mean, all I have to do is locate these two brackets where I want them, drill them through the backside and screw them in position, and then also locate this guy somewhere. You know, I was gonna put this little cable holder piece somewhere inside the box, but I'm realizing that if I just put it right here, it's probably gonna function better and it's gonna be much easier to install. So that's what we're gonna do. And just as soon as I had finished assembling everything, I took a big step backwards and took it all apart. Don't worry, everything fit just fine. I just find that it's easier to finish things while they're in a disassembled state. While the CNC did cut the wood pretty well, there were still some small tooling marks here and there. So I took a few minutes to sand those out and then round off any harsh corners. And then it was time to apply the finish. Lucky for me, I still had some of the same finish that I used on the desk originally. So all of these parts should match the old ones pretty closely. I rolled on two coats and then left everything Thing to dry. All right, all this stuff is now dry to the touch. So let's take it home and get it set up in the desk. Theoretically, this should be just about the easiest install ever. I didn't modify the outside of these boxes in any way, so they should just slide right back into the desk. However, I do still have a few things left to do to the laptop drawer. Things first though, let's do the lens drawer because this one should be nice and easy. Just slide it back into its spot and then fill it up with the lenses. Look at this, every lens with its own specific spot and now they don't rattle around when I open and close the drawer. Now, one thing that I did notice that will kind of suck is if I decide to buy a new lens, I won't have a specific spot for it. But I also realized I haven't bought a new lens in years. I'm actually really happy with this current lineup that I have. And also, if I do buy one, I do have all the project files for this saved so I can just spin up a new lens organizer with really minimal effort. Now on to the laptop drawer. And one thing you might have noticed in the shop is that on these brackets, there's actually a little bit of room around the laptop. So when I open and close this door, it might slide around a little bit. In order to prevent that, we are going to add a friction material to these brackets. It's nothing too fancy, just some adhesive felt strips that we are going to stick in place like so. I can't even get this started. This is where having short nails is such an issue. There we go, got it. This way, the laptop is gripped firmly in the brackets and it won't get scratched when I take it in and out. Let's give this a quick test and oh yeah, that is much better. And now we just have to pop this drawer back in its slot, which is easier said than done sometimes. Get the bottom on first, get the top in. Now it should just slide right in. And we got one thing left to do. We are going to connect this USB power cable to the power bar at the back of the desk here and then route it into the cabinet where the drawer is with the laptop. And I'll lock it in position using the cable clamp that I made earlier in the shop. Yeah, something like that. 
And yes, I realized it was silly of me to install this drawer first because I had to take it out in order to get that cable in there. But now that cable is always there and ready to be plugged into the laptop whenever you open the drawer. Unfortunately, this cable is just a USB-C charging cable. When I started this video, what I wanted to do was turn this whole drawer into a dock, and I still do plan to do that, but unfortunately, I ordered a Thunderbolt 4 dock for this laptop, which would allow me to connect the display, all the peripherals, and charge it with a single cable, but it didn't get here in time. Oh, and for anybody worried about heat building up in the drawer while the laptop charges, don't worry about it. There's a big 300 millimeter fan at the backside of this cabinet, which pulls air through, and just like that, we are done. With a little bit of time in the shop and a little bit of time on the X-Carve, we were able to dramatically improve the functionality of this desk. And along the way, I learned a lot about using my X-Carve and I hope you by proxy did as well. And it also got me very excited about the future of what I can do with a CNC. Because sure, I could have made all of these parts using traditional techniques, but doing it with a CNC I think was faster and easier. And importantly, it's now also infinitely repeatable because I can share these plans and dimensions with other people who are free to adapt them, modify them, and recreate them at home. Like, yeah, sure, this project in particular probably won't be done that often because nobody has a desk exactly like mine, but take something a little bit more generalized, like say a speaker build. I could sit down, design a speaker, share that with everybody, and then I could make a video where thousands of people will be able to follow along at home simply by pressing that glowing blue carve button in the easel software. And that's really cool to think about and definitely something that gives me a lot of incentive to do more XCAR projects in the future. But before I can do any of those, I have to end this video. So thank you so much for watching. If you enjoyed this video and you'd like to support the channel, the best thing you can do is like, comment, and subscribe if you aren't already. Additionally, there's all sorts of links in the video description, all of which help the channel in some way, especially that Skillshare one. All right, everybody, that's it for me, and I will see you in the next video. Peace.